the Bethlehem Royal Etudes. First shared publicly May 7, 2016 on reddit.com slash r slash no sleep. I'm appraising the old slob's possessions while he's still shuffling towards the bathroom. Dementia patients are usually suggestible, but this geezer surprises even me. He was glad to welcome me into his room, despite having never met me before, and right away he offered me tea from the electric kettle on his window sill. When I suggested that he wash up so that I could take him out to dinner, he rose immediately to do so. There's nothing obviously valuable for me to pocket, so I begin opening drawers as the bathroom door clicks shut behind the old man. I don't expect him to have much. People with money don't end up in care facilities like this one. In fact, this place is so crummy and understaffed that I've been able to come and go for months now. I tell the staff I'm a deacon providing volunteer ministry. No one's bothered to ask what church I'm from. I hear the sink's faucet start running from behind the bathroom door. I crouch to investigate a footlocker that is half stowed beneath the old man's bed. Inside are mostly knickknacks, photographs, and old receipts. I begin to wonder if I'm wasting my time. As I dig through collection though, I notice an expensive looking book with gilding on the page edges, and a real leather cover. I flip through the book quickly. It appears to be a diary that's been filled with dense, scribbled sheet music. The clefts and staves are all sketched out by hand, and waver unevenly across the pages. The notation is irregular to the point that it is almost unreadable, and the handwriting suggests that the composer worked at a very rushed pace. Tall, in delicate lettering on the inside cover spells out an apparent title, the Bethlehem Royal Etudes. In total I count five distinct compositions, each arranged for a solo piano. The sink stops running, so I quickly shut the footlocker and push it back to its place halfway beneath the bed. The diary goes into my satchel, which I fasten shut and sling over my shoulder. The book is probably almost worthless, but at the very least I know antique shops in this area that would take it off my hands. First though, I'll try selling the music to some of those filmmaking students I always see hanging around town. The bathroom door swings open slowly, and I can see that the old man's eyes are already clouded by forgetfulness. He remembers that he was preparing for something, but beyond that he's already lost the thread of it. Well. I've had a wonderful visit. I say, projecting my enthusiasm while also moving towards the exit. We'll have to do this again soon, okay? I clap him gently on the shoulder, and he smiles in a dazed, polite way. As I pass the nurse's station near the elevator, no one acknowledges me. I'll need to hear this music before I can describe it to potential buyers, so I head back to my apartment to transcribe the songs for my player piano. The piano was a gift from my father. Dad was an avid musician his entire life, and he always hoped that I'd develop a passion for it like he did. He bought me the pianola at a yard sale back when he was still alive, and he even got extra tools and supplies so that I could write my own songs for it. Now that he's gone, though, it's mostly just been a keepsake. At first it's tricky to decipher the handwritten notation from the diary, and even more difficult to use the perforating tool to mark the pianola paper without making mistakes. Eventually, though, I begin to get the hang of both, and my progress becomes more rapid. Although he never made me love it, Dad did at least succeed in teaching me to read music. After a short while, the first song is ready to be heard. As the player piano creaks into motion, a somber melody begins to ring out over the automatic keys. Even though I transcribed each note myself, I am astonished by the strange and precise harmonies that form as the song continues. The piece develops into something that marches loudly across the keyboard, brutal and full of contempt. 
In my head I imagine a criminal facing execution, speaking cruel final words to the families of his victims who watch him through glass from the adjacent room. By the end of it, I am anxious and in a bad mood. I suddenly very much want a nap, so I go straight to bed and sleep for several hours. The second piece of music is completely worthless. It's nonsense. The song wanders through different keys and time signatures for its whole duration, then ends abruptly. Even worse, it changes tempo in a way that makes it absolutely infuriating to sit through. A few minutes after the music has stopped, I notice an unpleasant sensation, like a pinched nerve behind my left eyeball. The migraine grows, and soon I find myself lying on the bathroom floor, paralyzed by the nausea and pain. After a few hours of writhing on the linoleum, my nose begins to bleed badly. The sensation of fluid pouring into my nostrils makes me stand up and retch into the sink. The nosebleed subsides after only a few minutes, but in that short amount of time I have bled profusely on myself. Strangely, my head now feels much better. I strip off my stained clothes and go to sleep for the night. The next morning, I call the care facility and tell them that I'm concerned about the old man's condition. Really, I'm just hoping for clues about this notebook. After a few guiding questions, I'm able to suss out vague details from the nurse who's answering phones. It seems the man originally came to their facility after he had burned down his house, killing his family in the middle of the night. I also find out that his current mental condition is from extended smoke inhalation. The nurse says the cops found him in his basement while the fire consumed everything upstairs. By the time that first responders found him unconscious beneath the ruins of his home, all the man had left in the world was a footlocker full of old junk. It must have been really important to him. The nurse tells me. I heard he carried it into the basement before starting the fire, and then he went back down there and wrapped himself around it once the fire was lit. The third composition requires me to disassemble the pianola and modify its tuning scheme and the mechanism for several of the hammers inside. The piece features quarter tones and other frequencies which are beyond and between the sounds of a traditional keyboard. Deciphering this entry in the diary and reconfiguring the pianola to suit it has taken me most of the week. I know that I need to be out there scrapping for rent money, but I can't seem to shake this weird idea that's been growing inside me. I need to hear the next song. Once everything is ready, the sound comes oozing out slowly, like trails of living slime groping across the room into my brain. Even after the music stops, I feel as though my skull has been infiltrated by something pernicious. That night, my dreams are disturbing and vivid. In the first dream, I am the old man who owns this notebook, but I am young again and living with my family. It is night time and I am lying in bed. I am waiting for my wife to begin snoring softly beside me. When it does, I creep from our bedroom and retrieve a canister of gasoline from the garage. I soak the carpets in each room with a bit of gas, but not enough to wake anyone with the smell. The door to my son's room creaks as I close it behind me, though, and I hear him stir and drowsily mutter, Dad. Softly, I call through the door. Go back to sleep, buddy. I have now listened to the fourth composition. My head is swimming and I cannot seem to think straight at all. The fog I'm feeling is so dense that I can barely describe what the song sounded like, even though it has only just ended. Something's wrong with me. Something inside me doesn't feel right. I think it's important that the pianola is taken apart. I should do that right now. Maybe I should even throw some parts out into the street, just to be safe. But before I take apart the pianola, though, there's something even more important to do. I need to burn the diary pages for this song, and the new paper I've transcribed it to as well. And when the song is ashes, 
I can bury the ashes somewhere far away. Or I can mix them with water and pour them down the drain and leave the tap running all night. Soon even the remnants of that sound could be miles and miles away. I don't have a fireplace, so I begin filling my bathtub with kindling from the apartment. I have spent all night undoing the damage I did to the pianola. The more I took the machine apart, the more an unrelenting itch began to build in my mind. I need to listen to the final etude, and as I've been working I realized that fighting against this urge was naive. I didn't used to believe in destiny, but now I'm sure that I've always been meant to hear what's inside this notebook. Before my dad even bought me the player piano, I was supposed to be part of this music's audience. And when the last notes ring out, I feel a final shock of clarity just as I had expected to. Now I understand everything that I had missed in the earlier works, and I am beginning to sense a truth built on ideas for which there are no words. It fills me with fury that the old man hid this music away for so long. He could have shared it with the world. But I can't condemn him too harshly, because I burned the fourth etude. This makes me the worst sinner by far. Of course I've done my best to recreate that lost etude on fresh paper, and I think I've captured its nuances very faithfully. Now that I understand their message, it's almost like the songs are etched into my mind. But destruction of the original was still a transgression. It was profanity against something great. I'll make that right somehow, though. I've mailed a copy of the whole suite to an old classmate of mine. She teaches music history these days, so I'm sure she'll at least give them a listen. Maybe she'll even bring them into her class one day, once she realizes how brilliant they are. The idea satisfies me, and I turn my mind towards penance for resisting the etudes and for trying to destroy one. The old man used fire to humble himself before the etudes. I see now that this was always his intention, hiding in the basement while his house burned. But I have no family to offer in the way of a sacrifice. Instead, I fitted my electric drill with a 1mm bit and shaved the side of my head. The bit is coated in styptic to control my bleeding, and the emergency dispatcher on the phone says an ambulance is on its way. Please just stay on the line and talk to me while help arrives. She tells me. I'll only need to be brave for a second, I tell her back. I tape the trigger down firmly, so the drill can continue running after my hand goes slack. If I'm lucky, maybe I can finally live a long life with no thoughts in my head at all. Yes, nothing in my head except memories of that music. What a lovely idea. <laughs>